Welcome to the Stutzman Channel. My name is Terry, and if you remember from the last video, if you watched it, we were working on a 94 Ford Ranger with a brake light indicator issue. Now, we already, I have that fixed, and that was the uh, parking brake switch was broken too. However, there was another issue of where we had an issue of where we started the, ish, the engine over in the start position there would be a self-check on the bulb. Now originally I, I said I wasn't going to mess with it, but I figured why not. Let's just go ahead and take a look at it. And let's just see what we got. And also we're going to be taking a look, uh, closer look at the brake fluid level switch. And also we're going to finally, we're going to be looking at this here wiring diagram. We're going to cover that load resistor that I was talking about. So we're going to look at that a little bit closer also. So just so that you don't, uh, if you didn't see the last video, and I'm talking about the uh, where you turn it over to the start position, the brake light indicator should work. Here's a clip of where I'm going to show you in the last video, for the ones that didn't watch it, of where the brake light indicator does not come on. And then we're going to find out why it's not coming on. Again, lower left corner. I did not see it come on. Okay, so now that you've seen that, let's take a look at the wiring diagrams and let's cover that a little bit. Now doesn't this diagram look familiar from the last one? Okay, so it's the same diagram. Now what we're being concerned of, what we're looking at in this video is about this here circuit right here. When you go to the start position, this here See, with the arrow, will swing over to the start position. That will place a ground on this wire. It will go through this here switch. Not through the switch, but there's a common terminal where there's two wires attached, and these two wires are on the same point. So it'll go through, it'll come out, it'll go through the diode, and then it places the ground on this side of the light. Now, I, re I refer you back to the previous video, so I'll put a link here in the description and also at the end of the video so you can see more about how we came to where we're at right now and the other checks that we made. All right, so now we look at it. We got an ignition switch. Okay, well, let's see. We got this ignition switch. There's a possibility we have this here. C105 connector. Could be an issue there. Possibly there's a there's an issue here on this terminal could be an issue on this terminal could be an internal issue inside the switch itself where it does a break now but we also know that this here diode and this wire is good to light the bulb because we did some other tests and we found out that was okay as far as the bulb so we know that all of this right in here is good okay so that's going to put our issue Maybe internally, maybe a bad uh, connection here, maybe this wire, maybe this here connector, this or the connector right here directly on the switch, or maybe internally in the ignition switch. All right, so what I want to do first, I always do the easiest stuff first because I don't feel like going under there and start dropping uh, covers down, taking bolts out, and you know, to get down to this ignition switch. I always do the easiest stuff first. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we could have an issue over here, right, with this here brake fluid level switch. So, what we can do to eliminate any internal stuff that's going on with the switch is that we can take this here connector, unplug it, and then what we can do is we can jump this wire here, it's a dark green with a yellow tracer, to this wire here, which is a tan with a light green tracer. So, Let's go ahead and we'll do that now. So as in the previous video, this is the connector that came off of the brake fluid level sensor. And as you can see, there's our green with the yellow tracer. There's our tan with a green tracer. And you can see that I have two wires and they all just jumped out. It's just a jumper. Just like what we said earlier, what we were going to do. So now let's go inside the vehicle. Let's crank it up. And let's see if that brake light will come on. 
All right, you should know the routine by now. Lower left corner, right down in here. I'm going to go to the start position, go ahead and crank the engine up, and let's see if we see that brake indicator light come on momentarily. And you saw that it did. Now, as you saw, the brake indicator light came on. And what we have done is we jumped out these two wires with the connector disconnect, uh, yeah, with the connector disconnected. Now, so we know that all of this right in here, the ignition switch and the connector here, is all good. So now that leaves us with the connector. Maybe, maybe there's corrosion on here. Now, I haven't really looked at it yet. Uh, or maybe internally inside this here switch, we could have a break in here. So let me take out the switch and we'll take a closer look at it. And also, I'll take a closer look at the connector too and the pins to see if we have any kind of corrosion that's on there. Okay, I got the switch out and it's right up underneath the master cylinder. It's got a little catch on it. Basically, you just push the tab on it and just slide it out. It's in a groove that's underneath the master cylinder. I'll flip this over so you can get a closer look. Okay, so I've got the switch here right beside the diagram. This here dark green with yellow is this one right here. It's the very first one all the way to your left. The next wire over is the tan with the light green is in the middle. The one all the way to the right is the black wire is where it attach. Now, if you notice over here on this far left one, you can see that there is some corrosion on there. All right, so we're gonna clean this up. We're gonna clean these terminals up a little bit and then what we're gonna do is you can see that these two right here, these two wires, they are joined together internally inside. So we should have a reading between these two terminals. So we're gonna, we're gonna check that. And then we also, we're gonna check the level sensor here, the switch itself. Now this here is a reed switch. There is a magnet that's on the float that's inside the master cylinder. When the float drops down, the magnet is attached to the float. Then when the magnet gets close to the reed switch, which is in here, then the contacts will close. So we can do a follow-up on that also, checking the switch. So let me get these here terminals clean, and then we'll do a meter check on it, checking the resistance. Before we do that, I told you I was gonna show you the, uh, and let me just lay it down, hopefully it'll focus. This part right here, this little, there's a little tab right there, and basically you just gotta lift up, there's a piece of plastic that goes over top of it that's underneath the master cylinder. Just to, I took a pick, and I just lift it up that piece of plastic so it will clear this tab and then I came from the back side over here this will be closest to the fender and then all you have to do is push it out in that direction this other tab over here this one that is for the electrical connector okay as you can see we have the terminals there on the reed switch cleaned up now what I did is I took a small screwdriver and I just put a number 400 grit sandpaper on there and I clean right up on the top and under the bottom of each one of these terminals. Then I followed it up with deoxid D100. As I mentioned, this is a reed switch. And before we get to the testing of this and using an ohmmeter, let's discuss what it is, how it's made, and how it works. Okay, the reed switch is nothing more than a mechanical device, a mechanical switch. There's two metal strips, usually made out of a nickel iron alloy so it will be a ferrous type material which will become magnetic in the presence of a magnetic field. Now the contacts here are usually made of rhodium or rudinium. Now this it and this gap and you can get this here in different configurations. This in this case is a normally open without the presence of the magnetic field. 
You can also get them normally closed. You can get them also in a single pole double throw configuration. They are placed inside of a glass vial. The air is extracted so you don't have to worry about the atmosphere being inside to worry about con you know contaminating the contacts. Then they'll fill it with an inert gas such as nitrogen and then the two leads are brought out side. In the presence of a magnetic field, when a magnet comes near, the contacts will close. For example, let's say that I brought a magnet near it. Okay? Basically what will happen is when the magnetic field gets say near to one end of this here, then it's going to through magnetic induction it's going to turn this strip into a magnet. That means that this will go to an opposite polarity pole, which will be a south pole here. That means this will be the north pole. Then the north pole here, through magnetic induction, will make this a south pole. Then on this end, it's a north pole. Unlike poles for magnets will attract, so then the contacts will come together. Now, this configuration of the magnetic field of where the magnet is perpendicular will create what they call lobes or active zones around the reed switch. Sometimes you could be three lobes or it could be four lobes and it depends for example, if the magnet is placed parallel to the reed switch and now let's say we're moving it in this direction and now you will get a different, different uh, type of operating uh, parameters of when these here contacts will open and close. And in this case, if I was to pass that magnet this way, starting say from over here and I went say across the right, the contacts would open and close three times because it's passing through three of these here active lobes. And also there's a dropout lobe of where you know you you can go up, uh, go outside of these lobes and then the contacts will open. Or in this case where the magnet is perpendicular to the reed switch and then you're moving it up and down, then it changes the number of lobes. Now, I don't want to go into detail and in drawing lobes and explaining all that because now we can add another 10 to 15 more minutes on uh, this video describing this reed switch. All we, all we really want to know is, I'm gonna, is, is this thing working, right? That's all we want to know. However, if you want to know more about how a reed switch works and all of these here lobes that I'm talking about, and all of these different configurations of how you can place the magnet and how you move it and how it will totally change the parameters of how this here contacts would open and close I encourage you to t take a look in the description I will put a link to a video I think it's the best one on YouTube that describes a reed switch describing all of these here different magnet configurations and how it actually works. It's got a nice animation. It's really good. Even the super techs. I encourage you to look at the video. Now what we're going to do is I'm just going to take the magnet and I'm going to put it in this position. Right? So if I come out here on, on near the end of this here reed switch then this here should close. If I was to bring the magnet over on this end of the reed switch it should close. If I take the magnet and put it directly over the center of the air gap, what do you think the contacts will do? That's, if you said that they will close, you're incorrect. They will not close. It will remain open. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that's why you need to go take a look at this video so you can understand why that will happen. Okay, so enough of this right here. Let's get to checking this here. Read switch out and see what kind of condition it's in. 
Now as you can see, I have these two terminals here. This is where my uh, ohmmeter leads are connected up. My red lead is connected to this terminal where the dark green with the yellow tracer wire is connected, would connect, and my green jumper lead right here is connected to this point right here, which is the tan, slide it so you can see it a little bit, which is the tan light green tracer, that's where that wire would connect, okay? Now if you look at our ohm meter, you can see that that's 0.3 ohms. And that's, that's a good reading because it's just showing us this here internal connection inside this here brake fluid level switch. So it looks like our issue that we had with the brake indicator light not coming on in the start position was more than likely it looks like corrosion. Now I'm going to take and move the green jumper lead over and I'm going to put it right over on this terminal. Now that will place it over over here on this terminal so now we're directly right across the switch. So let me move it over. Now if you look at our ohm meter you can see that we're at about say 2. Point, or say 2.6 meg ohms. Now remember, this is just a standard switch. It's a mechanical switch. This ideally should be OL, out of limits, right? So it should be an open circuit. So that's our first thing that we see. Now, let's take and get a magnet. Now I have the magnet here. You can see that I've got, got it marked it's with a north and a south pole. And it does not matter if I put the north pole down or if I put the south pole down. Now, like I mentioned earlier, you can put this magnet in all kind of different configurations of how this here reed switch will activate. And you will get different responses. So. You know, so it might be helpful to know that how you place the magnet in there to know what to expect of how these here switch contact here is going to change state, depending on where you put the magnet at and in what orientation that you have it. So let me get over here. And I'm just going to use the North Pole. Like I said, it doesn't matter. And I'm just going to turn the reed switch sideways. Now remember, I said the reed switch is located right in here. So, I'm going to bring the magnet in near one end of where that contact would be. And if you look, you can see we got 0 0.768 kilo ohms, 768 ohms. Now remember, this is just a switch. That should be a lot lower. Now watch what happens when I move the magnet upward. I'm going to the center to where the air gap is. Remember that's where that's where the magnet should open it. And if you saw right in there, that is where the center of the contact is. Now you see we're back to 2.8 mega ohms. Okay? Now I'm going to move it up. Now you see how it closed. Now I'm on the other side of the contact. Okay? And if I continue on, it should stay closed until, of course, when I get outside of that active zone, and then it'll open back up. Okay? Just one more time. I'll see if I can find that center gap. There it is. Whoops, just went back. Right there. So you see it? Right there. It's very, very small. I just open, move it, and that closes again. Okay? So, so we have a bad reed switch. Now as a quick check, to verify that it was the corrosion on the terminals here causing the issue of where we didn't see the bulb check when we started the engine let's go ahead and let's just go ahead and plug up the connector over on the vehicle 
to the reed switch. Let's crank the engine again and let's see if this here brake light comes back comes on when we start the engine. All right, so I plug the reed switch back up into the connector. I'm not going to slide it back underneath the master cylinder as that's not needed to do this test. So I'm just going to leave it just hanging down. So let's go crank it up and see if this here brake indicator light comes on when we start the engine. Lower left corner, let's see if this light comes on when we crank the engine. And it did. Now since we saw that brake indicator light come on when we took and started the engine, that pretty much looks like it was the corrosion causing the issue on that. So now, let's take a look and let's see what a new one tests like. For anyone that's interested, this is the Motocraft number for that uh, brake fluid level switch. Okay, we have the same original setup that we did earlier on the old switch of where we're ch checking this here internal jumper. And as you can see, it's the same thing, 0.3 ohms. Now let's take and move the green jumper over Sorry about that guys. And let's move the green jumper over just like we did on the other switch. And now, what do you notice? In the other switch we had about 2.5, 2.6 mega ohms. Here we have OL, out of limits, which is good because it's a switch. That's what it should measure. Now, let us get the magnet and let's see how it works on this one. Turn it sideways so you can see how far I will be away. I'm going to use the North Pole again. Again, it doesn't matter whether I use the North Pole or the South Pole. I'm going to come down onto one end of the reed switch and you can see that it went to 3 ohms. I'll move it up. As you can see, it went OL. I'll move it up a little more. And as you can see, it goes to 3 ohms again. And that switch is perfectly fine. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to quickly go ahead and I'm going to install and put this back into the vehicle. All right, so we have the new brake fluid level sensor. There's our latch tab, uh, tabs here for our latch. We flip them over. So we have the terminals on top. Put it inside and push it in. That'll lock it in. We'll take our connector and then we're just going to take and we're going to slide him on and then we will push him on and then he will lock in. And that's it. Alright, let's confirm that everything is looking and working good in this here circuit. So I'm going to turn the switch to the on position. I'm going to press the parking brake all right, that brake indicator light comes on. Going to release it. If we had an issue with the brake fluid level switch, say it was stuck, then we would have that brake light indicator to come on, but I'm sure it would come on if this here fluid was to get low. And finally, let's start the engine, put it over in the start position, and let's just see if this here light will come on momentarily. And it came on, and it went out, so that all looks good too. All right, let's take a look at this diagram here. In the previous video, I was talking about this here resistor, which I refer to as a load resistor. Now this resistor is a 1K resistor. In its application of how it's being used in this circuit, it technically should be called a pull-up resistor. Now, let's take a look at it, say, with both of these switches open. Now, in this condition, Let's see what's going to happen. We're going to have our voltage, B plus volts. Let's say it's 14 volts. Of course, you know that can vary. That's going to come down to the top of the resistor. Now, we're going to go with that voltage through the resistor. But let's see if we can find a path to ground. Remember, if we can't get back to ground, we're not going to have any current flow through this resistor. Okay, so let's see. There's a ground. My switch is open. Nope, can't go through there. 
Let's try, try over here. Nope, there's a grant, but I can't go through there because this is open. All right, but look, there's another path right here. That, well, no, you can't go through there either because this here diode in the orientation that it's in is, is a blocking diode. So it can't go through there. So what, what does that mean? That means with our 14 volts here, that means it's going to be 14 volts here. Our B plus voltage is going to be the same. Whatever it is here, that's what it's going to be here. Now, if you was to take a voltmeter and you was to put it right across this resistor and you had 14 volts here and 14 volts here, well, what would you have? You would have the difference between these two points. And that's what your voltmeter is measuring. 14 minus 14, zero volts. Now, but let's take a look. Let's see what else we got. All right, so we have our 14 volts. Can't go down through the switches. 14 volts is coming out, coming out. Okay, look, it's going out to the anti-lock brakes. That's, so this here wire is heading off to the anti-lock brake module. All right, so with both switches open, we got our B-plus voltage coming out to the anti-lock brake module. All right. Now, let's take a look and see what we have if we have one of these switches to close. It could be this switch, it could be this switch, or we could have both switches closed. It does not matter. Now, let's say that this switch was to close. Okay, so the switch closes. We got a B plus voltage. It comes down. It goes through, comes down. But look, now we now we get into ground. Now we have current flowing through this 1K resistor. Okay, so you, can you see that when the switch is closed, this is the ground. The ground is going to be applied on this side. Now if we took our voltmeter from ground and measured to here, of course we're going to measure zero volts because we're at the same point. Now, 14 minus zero with our voltmeter, if we were directly across there, we're going to get 14 volts dropped across this resistor. And we're going to have current flowing to ground. And keep in mind, the current is not going to go back through the blocking diode because, you know, it's because of this orientation of the way it's sitting there, it's not going to pass this way. It's not going to go up through. It's only going to come down. So now at this point, we have zero volts sitting on this wire. Now we have zero volts going out to the anti-lock brake module. Now you can see that this is serving as an input going to the anti-lock brake module. Now with both of these here open, you can see we'd have 12 volts or 14 volts or whatever our B plus is going out to the anti-lock brake module and everything is good and now you're going to have anti-lock any, uh, any locks uh, brakes you know if you need them now let's say if you had one of these switches here to close like say say your brake fluid level got low now this switch would make now you're going to ground okay so now you have put zero volts out to the anti-lock brake module and once it sees zero volts it knows there's a problem so it's going to disable your anti-lock braking system okay now, how do we get how do we get pull up pull up resistor? Take a look at this switch. We've been talking about this one here. Let's say it's uh, let's say it's closed, right? Okay, we know there's zero volts here, right? We know there's zero volts. Now let's say we had our voltmeter here. From there to there, we're looking at that wire. We got zero volts. Now let's open this switch. What is it going to do? Well, we don't have no current flow, so that means that we're going to have the B plus voltage right here. So the voltage rose up from zero volts to B plus. Therefore, since it rises, it pulls, it pulls up. So now the voltage is pulled up to the B plus. So they call this here a pull up resistor. So that's why you know that's uh, how I got the name. Now, since we are talking about a pull up resistor, let's, uh, and this is an educational video, Let's cover that just a little bit more because there is another variation that you will run into that's called using a pull down resistor. Now let's go and draw this circuit that we've just discussed that's on the wiring diagrams and that was that pull up resistor. Now let's take, let's put our B plus. Remember we had our resistor. It was a 1K. 
Then we had a brake switch, brake fluid level switch right here. All right, and at this point right here is where we went to the ABS module, which is an input. Okay. Now, just exactly like we had on the wiring diagram. Now, this right here, as we already mentioned, that's the pull-up resistor. All right. Now, let's draw the other variation of this where we use a pull-down resistor. Again, we have our B+, plus. but now this time, we're going to take these two components, the resistor and the switch, and we're going to flip them. So now, let's say that our brake fluid level sensor is in this here, or level switch is in this position. Now, we're going to go down to a resistor, a 1K, and now we're going to take this point and we go out to our ABS module, which is an input. Now you see the difference in it? Look at it with the switch open. If The way to determine about which way is, is it going to be a pull-up resistor or a pull-down resistor by the way, let me write that in here. This is our pull down resistor, which is right there. The way you can tell is by looking at look at the switch when it's in the open position. Then with the switch open, what is the voltage at that point? Well, this one here with the pull up resistor that we have on the wiring di diagrams we discussed, you can see that you will have B plus here. But now take a look at this one. With the switch open, you can see that we will have zero volts here. So it's exactly backwards. When the switch closes here, you will have zero volts when switch is closed. Down here, when the switch closes, you will have B plus when switch is closed. So the way I keep up with it is look at it with the switch open and then look at what the input is doing. Is it at B plus or is it at zero volts? If it's at B plus, then that will be a pull up resistor. Down here, again, look at it with the switch open. Then look at your voltage. If it's zero volts, like in this case, then this will be a pull down resistor. Or you could actually remember it about where the orient where the resistor is at. If the resistor is at tied to B plus, then it's going to be a pull up. If the resistor is tied to ground, like in this case, then it's a pull down resistor. Hopefully that's uh clear as mud for you now right now let's take a look over here last thing we're gonna wrap it up let's take a look over here on 42-1 and this is this wire taken off take a note of the wire color it's a tan with a light green tracer so let's flip over there and we'll take a look and see where this wire goes all right here's our page 42-1 and if you take a note you can see there's our there's our ignition switch there's our brake fluid level switch, just like we saw from the previous page. And here is the wire, the tan with the light green tracer, right here, heading off like from the previous page, heading over to the anti-lock brake module, represented by this here rectangle. And as you can see right there, brake fluid level input. And so we already learned that if you had zero volts on here, then we know that the anti-lock 
brake module is going to disable the anti-lock braking system. And if you've got B plus voltage coming on here, then it knows everything is good. And hopefully, if you don't have any other problems coming in as an input, say, to your anti-lock brake module, then you should have anti-lock uh, braking system working. Okay, so that's going to wrap it up. So hopefully that's a little bit clearer on uh, what that resistor and what its function was. Okay, guys, that is going to wrap this video up, and I hope you found it useful. Uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, I'm looking at it for the beginners who's starting out, just taking something step by step, going through it, find out how the circuit works. That's the key to everything. And especially if you're a DIY guy, so it's really no excuse, you know, why you can't, if you get your manual, sit down, study it, read it, watch some other videos out there. There's lots of great channels out there that you can learn from. Not like in the old days where you had to maybe go to a library or buy yourself a book. So stay with it. I wish you all the success in your repairs. And we still got some other issues with this truck. You know, I got a check engine lights on, the ABS light pops on and off, you know, so, and that's been going on for a little while. So now that I'm retired, I got a little bit of time here, so hopefully we can catch you in the next video and we can take care of looking at some of these issues and see what's going on there. You guys take care. We'll see you in the next video.